She said the video didn't show. She's restarting. I'm going to go live on Zoom. All right. And I see Chuck. So mute me, please. Setting up. I'll mute you. Zoom. She said the video didn't show. She's restarting. Okay. Oh, let me get back here. All right, we muted Dennett, and now we are going to go live and start the party. Okay. All right, everybody. We're just, oh, we have seven attendees already coming in. Sorry, we're just a minute behind here. We are having some technical difficulties today. Um, thank you all. You have been coming all this week and seeing, you know, all the great speakers that we've had. Um, we're really excited to uh, continue the conversation next week. Uh, but today we have um, Aileen Tisser. She is a physical therapist and she is going to present today um, on various uh, movement uh, strategies and videos and things that she would recommend that you incorporate into your uh, movement program as you start your planning for next week. Please watch all the way to the end because I do have some important information to share with you about registering for the week next week since we will have a new registration link available and we will give you a preview of the speakers that are coming up. So you don't want to miss that. And with that, I am going to remind you this is a 30 minute webinar series. We will talk for about 20 minutes and then um, have uh, parents have an opportunity to ask questions. I did turn on the chat. So if you're not comfortable speaking up, um, you can type your questions into the chat. If you need to ask a private question, uh, you can also, um, you can also ask your question via the Q&A box uh, privately so that, um, so that no one else sees it and then the panelists will respond to you. So I am going to turn it over now to Aileen. Aileen, welcome. We're so glad that you are here with us today. And um, what do you wanna tell us? Well, I firstly would just like to say it is truly an honor to be with this wonderful panel of experts. And today I really wanted to give you the opportunity to have practical strategies that you could take away from this webinar and adjust it to your specific situation. I feel like everybody is going through their own individual um, struggles, especially when it comes to movement and everyone's children and everyone's family has different needs. And although we're all in this together, I know some of you are struggling with some of the more generic recommendations and maybe even some of the recommendations that you've gotten for school. So I want to give you kind of an eclectic um, overview so that you can pick and choose what's going to fit for your family. So I'm hoping that Aubrey can share the screen um, and show you the handout that is printable. Or um, Aubrey, do you need me to? Oh, no, I can definitely share the okay. screen. Um, but you, and then I'll get that up for you and you can keep talking. Let me just Perfect. So these oh strategies and resources are printable and don't worry about printing it right now, but I want to explain each one and really empower you to figure out what your child is needing on a particular day. So at first I thought it would be a good idea to talk about self-regulation. And self-regulation, just as an overview for, for some of you that might not understand what that is, it's the ability to feel totally organized and calm and present in your body so that you can do what you need to do to get through your day. Now, we might not always recognize when we're regulated, but we definitely know when we're not regulated. And when you're not regulated or when your child's not regulated, it looks like, um, possibly tantruming behaviors, constant movement, constant running around aimlessly, um, you know, maybe some behaviors come out and you just can't get your child to engage with you. So a general rule of thumb, and this really works for the child that does have the ability to regulate themselves, but just sometimes falls apart. 
A general rule of thumb to understand when this is happening is you want to do a movement break that has three components to it. Proprioceptive, which proprioceptive is heavy work to your body. It's using your muscles and your joints in a heavy work kind of way where it's giving you feedback to where you are in space. The other wonderful thing about proprioception is it releases a neurochemical in your brain. And that chemical is called serotonin and it just makes you feel good. So doing these kinds of activities makes you feel good. An example for something like this would be animal walks, walking like a bear, walking like a crab, maybe something as simple as helping you pull wet clothes out of your dishwasher um, out, of your, out of your laundry machine and putting it into the dryer, not your dishwasher, um, your washing machine, and putting it into the dryer. Maybe having a sibling sit on a blanket and the other sibling kind of gives them a sled ride around the house as they pull the blanket. Or even as simple as you're laying on the floor and you're having your child kind of do a tug of war to try to help pull you up to standing. That's heavy work. Following a heavy work activity, and it could just be a couple of minutes, um, you would do something that's vestibular. What vestibular activities are, they're activities that involve movement in space. And there's a progression of vestibular activities that our kids like to do. Some of our kids are real seekers and love this kind of movement. And they go right to the spinning, which is pretty intense. But just starting with an up and down movement, something linear, even moving in an arc, is kind of the progression of vestibular in input. And you would just see how your child responds to that. If that's not enough, you might wanna do some kind of spinning and maybe even some kind of inversion where they kind of look between their legs, then they look up at the sky, look between their legs, look up at the sky. That's vestibular in nature. So moving their head in space. How many of you think that your child likes to move, but then when you really watch them move, they don't really move their head separate from their body. That's something to think about when you're wanting them to do something vestibular. It's really about the head moving in space. Okay, something to think about. An example of that would be randomly turn on music and do a little freeze dance, but do freeze dance where you're getting your child to really move their head around. Everybody dances crazy. Everybody looks at the sky. Everybody touches their toes. Everybody moves their head side to side. That would be vestibular input. You wanna follow that once again with proprioceptive input. So the recipe that I'm giving you for self-regulation is proprioceptive activity, vestibular activity, followed by proprioceptive activity again. A couple of minutes of each. This could be five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, depending on what your child needs. Then go back to whatever functional activity you are trying to work on, whether it's a school worksheet, whether it's just sitting quietly at the table for everybody to have dinner, whether it's just having them now sit and have some screen time so you could attend to some other things. But this is a little recipe of a movement break for self-regulation. Okay, Aubrey, is there anything you'd like to add to that before I move on? Um, I think we had um, talked at the beginning of the week about that body activated learning sequence um, and setting up your house in, in a way where you can allow for those opportunities for whole body movement, whether it's with your academics or separate from your academics, but you definitely want to be including all of this proprioceptive and vestibular input as part of either kinesthetic learning or even just a, a very, just very purposeful movement break um, prior to going back to your functional activities and integrating all that input that you just gave your body. Um, so for example, I have been working with a child all week, alternating his academic work and his movement breaks, but today he, you know, he really was just like, you know what, I haven't had my real OT gym time all week and I really, really need it. So we really ended up shifting away from the academics and spending most of our time doing exactly what you're saying right here, you know, giving that proprioceptive and vestibular input to really just get him regulated and know that, you know, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes you really do need just a bigger movement break or a longer period because doing five or 10 minutes here and there might, might not be enough. 
Perfect. So yeah, this doesn't take the place of any exercises you're trying to do, but it's just a quick fix to say, this is what I need to do right now to get my child calm. And when I'm short on ideas, I just go to a nice rote Simon Says. Si and I'm going to give you an example of a quick Simon Says routine that addresses all of this. Simon Says, everybody do 10 push-ups on the wall. Simon Says, everyone run backwards. Simon Says, everyone run up the stairs and then down the stairs. And then Simon says, everybody try to do a tug of war with this towel. So it was proprioceptive, it was vestibular, it was proprioceptive. Or Simon says, do the wall push-ups. Simon says, everybody twirl like a ro robot, freeze. Simon says, look at the sky. Simon says, look at the floor. Simon says, 10 wall push-ups again, and then we're done. Just, it could be that quick. How do you know how much time is enough? That's a, a common question that I get before I move on. And you know you did enough when you start to see your child engaging more with you and, and calming down and getting more organized. So when it doesn't work, sometimes I think to myself, did I do it long enough? Did I do it intense enough? So moving on, the next topic I wanna talk about are ready body learning minds exercises. And the reason I thought this was so important to share for a movement break is because the physical therapist that developed these exercises was told she had to see 85 children a day in the school that she worked at. Now that's impossible. Nobody could give a good quality session if they have to see 85 kids. So she came up with this brilliant idea of setting up these movement labs in classrooms and teaching teachers and teaching teaching assistants a series of exercises that address the core, proprioception, reflexes, vestibular, and eye-hand coordination. And she put them into a fun little obstacle course and she asked the teachers to do it every morning in her class. Well, lo and behold, they did some research on these kids' learning potential. And there were kids in the class that didn't need these therapeutic exercises. And there were kids that did, but everyone improved. So I like things where you get a lot for your for your buck. And I like things that are multitasking. And especially during this time when we don't know what to pick and choose to do, this little video, it's very short, gives you the four exercises that she recommends. And it's a beautiful, easy to follow instruction to strengthen the core and integrate three common reflexes that a lot of our children struggle with. So feel free to take a look at that and try some of these exercises with your kids. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is another group um, that is doing a lot of intense work. It's called the Muscatova Method. And this is a group that is very intense and does a lot of excellent work on integrating reflexes for trauma. So that if you've gone through a traumatic experience, a lot of us go back to reflexive kind of movement because we're in like survival mode integrating this fight and flight kind of startle reflex and just doing movement patterns that calm the central nervous system and make you feel organized. So she put it together into this 25 minute kind of like a yoga flow video. And I did it the other day and it was wonderful. The only negative is that your child would have to be able to sustain attention for 25 minutes and follow these very specific rhythmic flowy exercises. But guess what? If they do five minutes and then you shut it and the next day or an hour later, you try five more, that's great. Or forget it all together. And you just do these exercises when your kids are quiet because a regulated parent helps regulate their children. So I thought this was really helpful and really nice. Some of it is a little bit intense with what it says about, um, you know, helping with with COVID-19 and all of this. I don't know, but I just can tell you that it does make you feel good and it calms your nervous system. And I'd like to take a minute to just show you one of the exercises. If your child will not participate in anything that you can do, it's called fear paralysis. And when someone has an over-emotional response and they are losing it, this one exercise does help. Um, this isn't an exercise that you should do every day, but I thought I can show it to you. And if you do it once, once a week or twice a week, maybe it will help when your child is really losing it. 
So basically all of these Muscatova exercises go to the beat of cha, 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 cha. And you kind of say it as you do it. And you're gonna tap five reflex points. The first one is you put your hand over your child's chest. And why don't you try it now and do it um, on yourself with me. And you tap over your hand three times like this. Cha, 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 three times. Then you go to the outside of the shoulders, right to the outside. Cha, 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 cha. Then you go to the elbows, right where the tricep would insert. So the tips of the elbows, you're tapping on your child to the beat of cha, 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 cha. Then you move and you put your hands to the outside of their hips. Cha, 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 cha. And lastly, you tap the soles of their feet. Cha, 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 cha. Chest, shoulders, elbows hips, soles of the feet. And again, I'm not giving you the therapy per prescription of how many times to do it, how often. Try it once and see if it helps. It can hurt and it calms the central nervous system when your child is in an over emotional response. So moving on from the Muscatova method, I just wanted to let you know that there are resources available online and some of them are very quick and easy. Our program, Swim Angelfish, is doing a daily three-minute movement tip. And for any of the listeners out there whose children are a part of the Swim Angelfish program, I feel like the kids are missing their instructors and missing their routines. So we're having each of our instructors and each of our core team members do a three-minute movement break. So there's a link on YouTube if you guys aren't on Facebook. But if you're on Facebook, on the Swimming Angelfish Facebook, pick out an exercise that your child would identify with. It's only three minutes and see if they'll engage with that a little bit. And it just gives you some fun, engaging little movement tips. I did find some um, resources online where some gym teachers posted really fun, engaging little movement series. So if your child will follow along with a video, there's two links. One is a PE teacher and the other one below is somebody in England who has a very charming accent. It was very engaging for me to watch. And he's also going through a whole exercise series and a whole routine that your child can do if you're getting um, pushback from them wanting to do the exercises with you. But you know, in summary, there are so many creative ways that you could be getting them to move. And you have to remember that even just turning on music when chaos is happening in your house and just having everybody do a five minute dance off or trying your best to do three yoga, yoga poses, even if your kids are making them up and you get them to do two or three that are real, like downward dog, which is very grounding, like child's pose, flexion, things where you're curling your body, very grounding during this time. Extension, activities where you're stretching up, very alerting at this time. So if you're feeling like your child's low energy, you might wanna try some poses that do a lot of extension. If you feel your child needs a little calmness, poses with flexion. But I'm more than happy to answer your questions and share resources. But I wanted you to at least have a guideline to understand there's so many things you can pick and choose from and so many things out there that you can be doing, but be gentle with yourself. And if you can only do it for a couple of minutes or you're making things up, as long as you're getting your kids to move and you're keeping in mind, okay, this was kind of heavy work. This was kind of vestibular and movement. And then I did heavy work again you're doing great. So I'd love to open it up for questions and see what you guys are thinking. Okay, so at this time, if you have a question, you can either type it in the chat box, you can message us privately, or you can raise your hand and we'll turn on your microphone so that you can share your question with everyone. Um, if I don't hear from anybody in a minute, I do have a couple uh, questions of my own, but I'll just wait and see if anyone wants to jump in first. All right. I 
think I'm going to ask my question, Aileen. Okay. So you gave a lot, you know, we talked, you, you talked a lot about the flexion and extension, you know, the, the gym class kind of movements, the movement videos. Um, one thing that I find a lot of my kids struggle with is that they're very dyspraxic and they actually do not know how to move their bodies. They don't, they really struggle to follow a video. And, and this may be a problem right now because there are a lot of, everything is coming through on video online. Do you have any tips or tricks for parents in helping to facilitate when a child is very dyspraxic and really struggles to motor plan what they're seeing someone else do? Yeah, I think it's a lot easier for kids like that to visually have somebody that's right in front of them that they're copying it with. I think it's very important that parents use very short, simple directions, even if it's not the whole coordinated exercise. For example, if someone was dyspraxic and you wanted them to do a jumping jack, I might be face to face and just say arms out or T, close, T, close, something very simple as opposed to, all right, we're gonna do a jumping jack. Everybody open up their arms and open up their legs at the same time. Then we're gonna close our arms and close our legs. You wanna be very simple with your directions. Another thing that might help is tight fitting clothes. Like wearing tight fitting clothes is very, you know, I'm in the water a lot and that compression of the water and the tight fitting clothes gives that same feeling of having them feel where their body is might help a little bit as well. And then the other thing is it's okay to break down an exercise and actually help move your child through it a couple of times and fade your prompts away, the better they get. So you might at first do the exercise for them. Then you might just be tapping their hand and saying arms up. Then you might just have your hand here saying hit my hand, you know, and move away from actually moving them until they understand it. Mm -hmm. The last piece that usually helps too, once they do get it, take a quick video of your child doing it. Sometimes when you show them the video of themselves, they're able to coordinate it better. Yeah, I think all of that's great advice. Um, and one of the other things you mentioned with the tapping and the lowering, one of the things that I also have found to be helpful is um, there are children who can't motor plan their body, but if you draw their attention to the goal, like touching something, you know, they might have figured out that motor plan. So you can hold the stuffed animal up or whatever, if you want to get them to reach across. And that might be enough to like get some motor intention going. So their body will execute the task, even if they're not coordinated to be able to do some of the alternating or the repetitive types of movement. You might just need to start with the basics because you're not quite there yet and then rely on things like swings or trampolines or you know other um, things that are a little bit um, higher input and less skill as that self-regulation piece and that connection to your body before you really try to do st stuff that has um, a larger coordination element to it. The other thing is sometimes um, putting like a color or a sticker if you have post-it notes, like a yellow post-it note on your right hand and a pink on your left and you know you can be yellow pink, yellow, pink, sometimes that's easier than arm up and move across, you know? Definitely, definitely. So yeah, so I mean, I think there's a lot of strategies that we use at th as therapists that we don't even really think about because we're so used to breaking down the movement sequence when we have a child who isn't that coordinated and going step by step. But, um, you know, if you have a child that maybe is much more sensory oriented, you're going to default to more of the high intense self-regulation kinds of activities before you move into the Muscatova or the gym class um, exercises and things like that. So it's really, I, I think, would you say, fair to say, Aileen, that, I mean, knowing your child, not every movement sequence or movement break is right for a particular population. Um, and I don't know if you can give some examples maybe of um, some different populations or, or challenges that different populations have where you've had to make some of those adaptations. Yeah, I mean, of course, if somebody doesn't have the co control or coordination to follow a, a specific exercise, you wanna move them through it, but then there's all, always ways to adapt. And um, I just did a little video that I put out because I was getting a lot of comments. Um, we were doing a lot of exercises that were um, simulating swimming to make kids still feel like they were a part of our program. And I was getting some really nice messages on Facebook that certain kids were loving it. And the kids that were commenting, 
commenting to me. Some of them are in wheelchairs and I was realizing I really didn't do anything to cater to some kids that might have other limitations and I wanna make sure everyone is moving. So knowing when to adapt something, doing it laying down, doing it sitting, doing it with a parent, you know, only, only doing it with a, you know, using a stuffed animal, you know, and just putting the stuffed animal on one side and then the other, maybe instead of diagonal sit-ups, maybe that's, you know, a way to modify so you can have success. Think of your end goal and then break down what you're trying to get so that your child's able to achieve it. So one of the other uh, questions that was asked is, is this going to work for teens who are emotionally dysregulated? What kinds of things would you lean towards for regulation? I know I talked at the beginning of the week about thinking um, about the restore concept using rhythm, pressure, and respiration. Mm -hmm. And I know that you embed a lot of that and even some of the Muscatova and the tapping you talked about um, embed some of those concepts just naturally into the task. Well, it's funny too, because uh, I, I did speak with a mom and I hope she's on right now, but not to, to you know, point anyone out, but some of the older kids that might not be able to follow any of these activities or recommended suggestions, they might have something that's very meaningful to them, like they like drumming or they like Bollywood music. You might want to change your whole movement strategy around something they enjoy. There's no reason why you can't put on that Bollywood music and you can't do a series of exercises sizes that are proprioceptive, vestibular proprioceptive as you're dancing. So, you know, modifying it that way. If it's a larger child that's really physical and needs to move, then maybe you do need to get out around your neighborhood. Maybe you do need to be running backwards up your driveway and then, you know, squatting down your driveway and thinking of ways to get outside and actually getting them moving their body in an, in an appropriate way. Definitely. I think those are all like really, really great points. Um, if you have, let's say a child who has Down syndrome, who doesn't move very fast under their own power, but really does benefit from that vestibular input because it does help with alertness and getting their eyes working and their bodies working. Do you have any strategies for that population? Yeah. Don't forget about rolling. Rolling is a great vestibular activity. And if you're not someone that really likes to get up and move, even setting up, I, I know we do this in our therapy sessions all the time, but if the end result that you want your child to do is a puzzle or a worksheet, you can make them go through certain movement strategies where the end result is that they get to complete the task that they wanted to complete at the end. So rolling is a great way to increase tone and engagement. Um, when somebody is low energy, you wanna think about things that are extension, you wanna think about things that are vestibular to get them alert and, and engaged and, and aroused. So you wouldn't start with something calm and slow. A child like that, you wanna be arrhythmic, you wanna put on fast salsa music, you wanna start rolling around and you wanna get them going. Right. I personally need the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell you're very high energy. So yeah, so think about, do you have to energize your child? Because that is going to be the way to connect them and get them more connected to you and the next thing that you're doing. Or are they really in that stressed and anxious and dysregulated place, meaning you have to go towards, you know, rhythmic movement and alternate vestibular proprioceptive and do it in a way that provides a lot of rhythm and repetition so that it allows the nervous system to kind of calm down and relax at the same time. You know, you um, bring up a, a great point, rhythm, bass, calm, you know, arrhythmical, alerting, dysregular movement is alerting. So keep that in mind too, if you're bringing movement into what you want happening and, and music. Definitely. So um, we have just about one minute left and I am going to jump to uh, our lineup for next week actually, because um, we do have a couple um, exciting things happening. Uh, let me get out of Aileen's uh, presentation here and just scroll up to let you know. We have quite a lineup for next week, everyone. Um, we're not sure on the exact days yet. We're still locking down our speakers, but we have um, Barbara Bataro, who is a mom who 
um, homeschooled her children even before the pandemic. And she's gonna give us a lot of actionable steps to help us create some strategies and set yourself up for su success in the weeks to come. We're also um, going to have um, Dr. Harry of Volgarakis, I hope I'm saying that properly, is a behaviorist and a psychologist, and he's going to be talking with us about strategies to manage uh, behaviors that you might see as a result of the anxiety, the lack of routine, sleep disruption, and being stuck at home all day that a lot of our kids are experiencing. Um, and then we also have Cindy Friedman. She is an occupational therapist and very well versed in emotional freedom techniques. So she'll be talking with us um, uh, next week about strategies that you can use um, and related to these emotional freedom techniques and give you some other uh, movement ideas that you can help um, utilize to relieve um, trauma and stress and anxiety and anything else that the kids are going through right now. Um, and our last one is actually one of our panelists. Um, Danette, do you want to jump in here and speak really quickly on what you'll be talking about? Oh, hold on. I don't know if Danette can hear me. Uh, but uh, all right, I'm 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 gonna power through because I can't get her I, I can't get her uh, microphone working. So she's a movement specialist. She's the director of the youth and teen programs at the Westport YMCA, and she will be talking to us about movement, music, and self regulation. I want to let you know. Oh, and one more person, Jennifer Purdy. She's the preschool director of Christ Church uh, Nursery in Greenwich. And she'll be talking with us about setting up strategies and routines, especially if you're a working parent, also trying to get all the schoolwork done at home and manage all the chores and everything that you need to do. She's really been working a lot with her parents on coming up with strategies and routines, and she's going to share with share those with us next week. A few reminders. If you already registered for this week, you are not automatically registered for next week's group of speakers. You do need to re-register for the lineup. We only have 100 registered slots where parents can join and ask their questions. So when you get the new registration link, please make sure you grab your spot so that you don't miss out if you want to be part of it to actually ask the questions. If you're watching this and you haven't registered, I am going to be posting new registration links on the Sensational Achievements Facebook page and the Sensational Achievements YouTube channel, as well as emailing uh, my regular list of people that I connect with. Um, I know that our panelists are sharing the information as well. So if you're connected to one of their social media pages um, or their email list, you should also also be getting the reg registration links. Um, don't forget, subscribe to Sensational Achievements, like us on Facebook. That's how you're going to get notified of the updates and when the videos are posted because we are replaying the videos on YouTube and trying to go live as much as possible. It's just that if you're not registered, you will not be able to ask questions during the talks. So please forward this information to anyone that's interested. We want to reach as many parents as possible and we're so happy that we have had as many uh, registered registrants as we've had as the week has progressed and we look forward to continuing to grow the number of participants um, that are joining us and asking so many great questions. Um, I'm really excited about our lineup um, and I'm so happy that all of you made it today to be part of the conversation. Uh, panelists, do you want to say anything else before we log off for today? I just want to thank you, Aubrey, for all of your hard work. It is not easy organizing this, and it is so meaningful and so needed. And I am just so, so incredibly grateful that you've done it. Thank you. It's been really exciting for me. I, I'm, I'm meeting so many more people as part of the process, and I really feel like uh, the parents are coming together and sharing information, which is exactly what I wanted. So anything, any comments that you guys have, even after these videos are finished, throw them on the YouTube channel, um, you know, post them in any moms groups that you're part of so that we can help more and more people across the country who are really struggling to help their children with special needs while they're um, staying at home for possibly the next month or the next few months. We just have no idea. So anybody else before we jump off? All right. Thank you all for coming today. Have a great day and we will see you next week.